Okay. Let's let's have a let's just pray uh, for God to bless and watch over us tonight and give us the direction we need. Father, uh, again, we do. We pray that. We ask that you uh, be the guide and the director of our evening, that Heavenly Father, that you uh, open our ears to your word, that Lord, you will use each one of us as iron sharpens iron, Father, to uh, be about your business and, and to learn and draw us closer to you, Father, tonight through your word. And then that we may pick something up tonight, Lord God, that nugget of truth that you put in our hearts, Lord God, that will uh, not just be a value of us, to us, from you, but also, Lord God, that we'll be able to take it and, and share it with others. And so, Lord, uh, again, we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you because of his resurrection, because of him being up with you and being obedient, Father, that he went because he needed to send the Spirit the comforter, the helper tonight, that we are asking to be in our midst and guide us and lead us, that Holy Spirit. We praise you and thank you for him. And uh, may we hear from him as we go about our night tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So here we go. A couple, couple things to read to you, to, to talk to you about, to make our, our, our wheels start turning. It says... How important is health? Well, you ask a sick man. How important is truth? Ask a businessman who has just signed a contract. Are the things we believe in important? Well, we ask, you'll just think of someone that might have believed the lie for several years. And the pastoral epistles. Go ahead. I think the things that we do believe in are important. They should be, yes. They are. They should be. Well, they are. Every time, whether you believe in truth or not, people believe in things they think it's important. And tonight we're talking about truth. Because in the pastoral epistles, that's First and Second Timothy and Titus, Paul speaks of the importance of sound doctrine. Doctrine meaning the word for doctrine or the word for sound is the Greek word that they use uh, that we get our word hygiene from. And so this word refers to that which promotes doctrinal, spiritual, and moral health. That sound doctrine. And, so the, and we have to remember that the ministries of Elijah and Elijah both called the people to spiritual and moral health by putting away deceptive idols and the way of Baal worship, right? That was the big problem back then, that they incorporated cultural worship. Uh, and times might have changed. You might, well, we're not in those times. But the isms that we deal with, they just have different names. But the heart of man has not changed. We are still prone to wonder like sheep who graze out and just oblivious to whatever's going around, dangerous poison weeds and unhealthy plants. That's why shepherds need, that's why sheep need a shepherd who understand the lay of the land and understand uh, the sheep and to give them the right food, water. And Elijah and Elijah were just a sh such shepherds for the nation of Israel. As we looked at that, that they helped, they wanted to try to draw them back to the one true God and to feed them on healthy truth. So we're going to look at what Paul has to say tonight what he can give us that can help us maintain our spiritual and moral health. And these truths affect us physically as well. The, the spiritual uh, truths and doctrine do affect physical health as well. So tonight we're going to start out in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. And if I have uh, 
a volunteer to get there. Now let's all get to 1 Timothy. If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. Ooh. What about Titus 1.9? Titus 1 9. You ready? He must he hold firm to. Go ahead. He must hold firm to the sure word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to confute those who contradict it. All right. How would you define sound doctrine? According to these words? Well, the teachings of Christ. Okay. Huh? Anything else? Prophets in the Old Testament. Okay. And they told us. Well, they instructed, God. they told the story of a lot right. of remembrance and pointing to Jesus. But Jesus is teaching are the main, uh, the gospels, and we have the scriptures that are of our our grounding of our doctrine of, of faith and practice is what we believe. We still need faith. Pardon me? We have to have to believe. Yeah. Uh, the readings, and then it, it, I guess it's from passed on down, mm -hmm. and you believe the word of God. But the, you know, how many of us don't believe in the word of God? You have to mm -hmm. believe what you, meaning that's faith, and faith comes from God who gives us graces. Give well, us the opportunity to believe in. We believe the word of God. That's pretty tough, you know, try uh, if you want to try to um, persuade a person to believe in God. I'm just talking about maybe the atheist. Okay. Today's world, trying to, you know, talk to somebody that just doesn't believe in God, period. It's hard. It's hard to tell. Oh, it is hard. You tradition, mm -hmm. you know, you go through tradition and it goes, it's passed on down through through years and years of the family. Jesus, look how long it was before, I mean, for, to B.C., you know, B.C. and then on to um, A.D. A.D., uh -huh. Look how long that was. All those people that w that came before Jesus. And then the main story, uh, one of the um, chapters that we read tonight in Scripture, it brought in um, Noah, and it brought in um, the main one in their words. They believed. They believed in God, and they had that faith. Mm -hmm. And that's how, you know, came about this. They lasted. And you have today. to stand on the truth. You got to stand on these doctrines. Uh, but we. So see, what is sound doctrine? Well, sound doctrine is is what you're saying. Sound doctrine is 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 the scriptures. Our sound doctrine comes out of uh, the gospels, Jesus's teaching, and uh, applying them to our lives, and, and Paul. Okay is writing these because our second thing, because there is contrary to sound teaching. Uh, and if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 9 and 10. 9 and 10. We also know that law is made not for good men, but for lawmakers, 
lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers uh, for murderers. Verse 10. Okay. Uh, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. <clears throat> Did you read all of verse 10? A L E. Oh, for adulterers and perverts, yeah. Okay. Uh, NIV uses the word for the sexually immoral and for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders, liars, and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. All right. It well, no, they have a couple different things they can subscribe to. I want the magazine first. So, what is contrary sound? What is what is contrary to sound doctrine? Sin. Yeah, sin, disbelief, sin turning it. your back on God. See, cause, yeah, because sound doctrine includes all the words of Jesus, his teaching, his words to the apostles, and his revelation in scripture. And so handed down through and by the apostles, there's used the Holy Spirit, right? Because the word of God is, is led, it is the Holy Spirit directed them to write what they wanted to write, to exhort, to encourage, and to build us up and convict of wrongdoing. That's sound doctrine. And, and so are the are contrary. Born, are we all born with a conscience? What's that? Aren't we all, all human, the whole human race is born with a conscience. Okay. To know the difference between right and wrong, which would be a godly thing. Right. So we have a conscience. All humans have a conscience. Now, some are weak, some are strong. I some actually are... find that hard to believe that all humans have a conscience. You have a conscience, but how you how that conscience is taught, how it is trained, depends exactly. on where you what your behavior is. Uh, exactly. The conscience can be seared. Scripture talks about the conscience being seared. In other words, you do bad things, wrong things, bad, long enough, you become seared and your conscience becomes like it, it doesn't matter to you anymore. Um, those kind of things yeah. can happen. But the scripture says what is contrary right there in 1 Timothy, that those groups of people as being contrary to sound doctrine. Contrary, meaning opposite, not being... Uh, yeah, lawlessness, opposite. rebellious, ungodly, unholy, profane, murderers, immoral, homosexuals, kidnappers, this one translation says, liars and prejudice. Yes, sir, I think these verses we just read, they're, they're very specific and they, they don't uh, require interpretation, but I'm thinking of all the different denominations we have and we have different denominations because there's different interpretations of what is sound doctrine. All doctrine is not quite as specific as some of these verses we're studying tonight. Mm -hmm. Right. And, it's, and it is very difficult. Uh, uh, we, we probably disagree with some doctrines of other denominations. And uh, so sound doctrine uh, involves interpretation whether we like it or not i think <laughs> mm -hmm. and yeah, we do have yeah in some of the sound doctrine like yeah i understand that that's true that some of them some den some denominations or, or others are feeling that some things are more important than others i think they all should come to i think we all come together on the jesus is the way the truth and the life yeah yeah and yeah. And those main teachings, uh, but yeah, there are some that, like you say, they switch off because they believe that, you know, salvation is other ways, you know, that, that you don't, you have to do other things. There's more works involved and there's more acts of, 
of, of things that uh, they, again, they interpret uh, those scriptures in certain ways. But these here, I mean, even these ones here are being interpreted differently today. Some of these are being interpreted differently uh, of being, you know, that this is contrary to sound doctrine. Uh, and we have to understand that it's important to have sound doctrine. It's important to, to do that because um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 6 to 8. But actually, somebody, uh, somebody go over to chapter 1. Oh, we did read by verses 9 and 10, so don't worry about that. Um, four, chapter 4, verses 6 and 8. And then someone else go over to Titus 1.9. 1 uh, Timothy 4, chapter, verses 6 and 8. 6 to 8. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. <laughs> What's Titus 1.9 say? He must hold firm to the sure word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to confute those who contradict it. So then what is the benefit of sound doctrine? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What is the benefit of sound doctrine? According to those verses, what's what is the benefit of sound doctrine? To hold firm to the word. Give you strength. But what does that do? Holding firm to the word, how does that help you? What's well, if I read the Bible every day, and of course, I don't know what everything means in the Bible. Right. So I have these books that I go back to all the time. Mm hmm I, if I read the Bible, read the scripture, pray every day, I think I'm going to hold as close to sound doctrine as I possibly can. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm not perfect, believe me, because I mm -hmm. do a lot of things I shouldn't do. But I think reading the Bible is like the secret to Staying with the faith. Mm -hmm. One of the little uh, scripture readings that, uh, or one of the spiritual readings, we have four little books here. It's on its place. And one of the spiritual readings for today's lesson was, was saying the the last sentences sentence was pray, prayer, pray, keep on praying and praying and praying. <laughs> Okay. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. and praying is important. Praying is, is, a, is a discipline uh, for us to, to have okay. a regular conversation with God. Uh, but sound doctrine, again, the sound doctrine is something that for our foundation of our faith and belief, so we know what decisions to make in life. Yes, we don't get them all right. But for those times that we know we do something wrong, how do we know that we're doing something wrong? Well, my conscience tells me. Okay. I think that living by sound doctrine brings wholeness and completeness, completeness to life. Uh, you, you are living with, with a less, uh, uh, I don't know what the word is, but you are not living uh, a life as fulfilling as God would like it to be for you unless you adhere to his admonitions. Mm -hmm. uh, that way we will, will lead as nearly a full and complete and wholesome life as we might. Otherwise, it'll be less than complete. <clears throat> yeah, that's, 
that's a lot of it to be profitable in all things um, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come so it, it helps us again as john said it helps us exhort others and also ourselves that we come under the exhortion of you know well this is behavior that we should be having and then also um helping us that we live our lives built on the solid truth that we grow, you know, we can grow in the freedom of Christ, knowing that we're not condemned and all these other doctrines that are out there that are false and, and to understand those things um, that we can healthy truth that applies to every age too. Cause um, second Timothy four, uh, one this four says in the presence of God and of Jesus of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing and his kingdom I give you this charge preach the word be prepared in season and out of season correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instructions for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. We're well, that's happening them. today. We're in some of them times today. Right. Oh, they don't want you to, don't, don't say that. We, that, you know, they want what their itching ears will hear. And that's uh, something that is coming up uh, pointing us toward the end times. Um, but that's not that we need. That's why all the more we need to stand up for this, even government coming against true God, the true doctrine of scripture and some of the things that they're passing laws on the churches are going to have to make a stance one of these days. Um, well, they and, should have been making the stance all along. Well, uh, that's why you don't have, you know, the prayer and school issue. Um, yeah, yeah. One woman was able to do that. What, uh, Timothy, uh, Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 8. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about you. So that's the older folks and the younger folks being taught and teaching one another. That's a, gen that's a generational passage there. That we have older men, older women teaching younger men, younger women, and setting them as an, setting an example before them so they can teach their generation. Pretty much covered everybody, didn't it? Yep. So there's not an age limit. Um, we don't get too old to teach, um, and we're not too young to teach. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing. I mean, a young. It says young women, young men. There again, it's it's again handing down to the next generation. And that's what our scripture is trying to tell us. Uh, 
And we see if we go back to Elijah and Elijah both, um, they had the issue of the, the, the Israelites being engaged very heavily in Baal worship. And Jesus illustrates this truth when he said in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of foot by man. <clears throat> trampled under foot by man. Now salt does not spoil or go bad but it can lose its taste. Now, the salt in the, in the New Testament day, uh, it came from an area around the Dead Sea. And sometimes the salt would be mixed. They would mix it with a jimson or some other mineral uh, that diluted or, or polluted it. And so as Christians, we can mix the truth with false false seasonings that dilute and pollute and even deaden our saltiness. Our actions, our living, our lives can pollute our, our saltiness. Uh, the doctrines, are, and so consequently, our relationship with the Lord grows stale and our witness is ineffective. Ineffectiveness loses its appeal and tastiness. And that's what happened in Israel. They were mixing the word and worship of Jehovah with the falsehoods and the deceitful rituals, ceremonies, and, and, and the superstitions of Baal worship. And I, th I think it's important that we realize why that happened, too, because when Joshua was commissioned to enter the, the land of Canaan and capture it, Yep. He specifically instructed to rid the whole uh, Canaanite country of that idol worship. The Lord must have known that, what an insidious type of thing that was. And they grew weary after a while, and they didn't eliminate all of it. And then they had interracial marriage uh, with uh, the Canaanite. native Canaanite people, yep. and, and they reverted to this. And it, there's a case, again, of of, of doctrine when you don't obey uh you suffer the consequences and, yep. and they struggled with this all through the old testament they never got rid of that Baal worship <laughs> yeah and it it ended up resulting in the spiritual moral decay of a nation yes <laughs> and that's exactly and you know we go we think back and go wow why do they why would they want to get rid of all everybody and i say it was really insidious when you think it aaron and miriam even got caught up in it yeah <laughs> and moses didn't show up for a while they were tempted and in, in formed yep. what a golden calf i believe golden calf yep yes that's all the more why we need to uh i think as donna said we need to be in the word we need to be in it and be it needs to be again the water to our souls so that we can grow uh, what Psalm 1 say about meditating on the word uh, day and night, uh, how important it is for us to walk in this sound doctrine and not allow the culture and, and false doctrine to cloud our, our minds and our hearts. Uh, because, you know, some of them, some of the people in the Old Testament, they were deceived to the point that they, they sacrificed children. I mean, that's how deep they got into this false worship. And so it's like a, a leprous man who begins to lose feeling in his hands or feet. The people of Israel began to lose their sensitivity to the Lord. Their conscience became insensitive, hardened, and calloused. Their love for the Lord grew cold and stale. Their walk became marked more by superstition than by the revelation of truth and their worship deteriorated into empty ritual at best and immoral pagan rites at worst. And that's how fast it can drop down. But you know what? In his love, what did God do? 
God had to rescue them out of that the, this diseased condition, even if it meant serious surgery. And the problem of sin in Israel was serious to God, and this problem should be serious to us as well. Is it serious to us? Hopefully it is. Hopefully we, and sometimes I think we get a little cold on it because we don't want to offend people uh, with, uh, because of false doctrine. But um, I think if we believe and walk in true doctrine, it, it, it shows, it reveals things. So Paul had words of caution for those he sought to bring to maturity. So he's trying to bring maturity to the church, bring mature in Christ. And he told the Corinthians this in, in 2 Corinthians eleven three, but I am afraid lest as the, the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. One of the greatest dangers a Christian faces in his devotion to God is mixing worldly opinion and philosophies with the word of God. Christians today are bombarded from every angle of society with uh, perceptives, uh, perspectives that radically differ from the teaching of God's word. And we see that. The battle is not won as we aggressively confront the lies, nor as we embrace the society in which we live or try to fit in. The solution comes through immersing ourselves in the truth and then living that truth. When we are grounded in the truth, the lies will be exposed for the solution lies counterfeit that they are but we will never fit in. It has been said, if the world fits, then your faith is the wrong size. If the world fits, then your faith is the wrong size. Because sometimes we want so much of the world. We, oh, we got to fit in. We got to be like the culture. We got to be. It's like, nah, you, you got to stand on. We got to stand on the word of God. That's right. So then, some application. In what ways are you receiving biblical input in your average week? And I got a couple things here. Uh, and you can put how much time. Uh, we have... Worship service, that's probably about an hour a week. Bible study group, tonight. I know John gets extra credit on this because he's got two or three a week he goes to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's good you do that, John. I'm glad. Uh, that that's, that's great. Personal Bible study? Yes. Christian magazines, novels, and books. Sometimes. Christian radio, TV. Yes, yes, there is a there's a good Christian radio that comes from Carlisle. Yeah, I have my alarm set for seven o'clock. Uh -huh. So I from seven to eight, and sometimes till eight thirty my weekly devotion okay great i'll show you how old this how old this this book is i'm reading out of because on that christian radio tv and there's a slash and it says tapes so when was the last time you had a tape and you got still you still got some cassette tapes maybe <laughs> Way under the bed. <laughs> it says tapes on here. So when's the last time a cassette tape? You know, I know we're way past eight track tapes, but uh, and then others. Oh, yeah. I don't have any of that. You can't even play a cassette player unless you have to have one of them little ones at home, or if you have an old stereo system that plays a cassette tape. Yeah, but, yeah I have those wild Christian TV that I wouldn't even bother watching. 
Yes. Well, there's it, some I really enjoy. Yes. On Sunday yes. morning are some really good pastors. Yes. There again, sound doctrine. Uh, and some of it you want to, you know, you can listen to. And um, I had a pastor friend tell me, an older pastor say, well, sometimes you can listen to that. You watch it and you just uh, chew, on, chew on the meat and spit out the bones. You know, because there's doctrine or stuff they preach that sounds it's it's good, but then there's some of it you just spit that out and uh, move on. <coughs> and so some of the Baal worship focused on the physical health, strength, the material, and even the sensual. Some were willing to practice immoral rites as a part of their worship or in conjunction with their offerings. Sometimes they went to the extent of offering a child in the fire of the altar veil. So it can be a slippery slope sometimes that people get into. Um, but let's look, look at some of these, uh, what we find about the potential of idolatry in our lives. And we got the last scriptures here we're going to go over. We're just going to read them and see what they have to say uh, uh, about this, the, the truths that apply to our lives. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let, one know, let no one deceive you with empty words. <clears throat> That's doctrine. That's what the word says. Um, now we might, now some of these, we see it. And again, well, we see greed get into us. Well, there's repentance then to repent of that greed and turn from it. Uh, those are the things that sound doctrine brings to us to get us back on the right path. Now the continual habitual person who continues to do these things. These are the issues that you have to turn from. Um, Colossians 3.5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. We understand that word covetedness. Yeah. Don't covet your neighbor's wife or his ox or his anything. What's the word covet mean? Want. To want it and to 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 uh, okay. use it, yeah, yeah. That you want you want those things, right? My version has greed, greed instead of covetousness. Oh, really? Because coveting is yeah, greed and coveting is. I think coveting. a little different, but Two different along the words. same lines. Well, you don't be greedy. Read your, ver read, your, read your verse then, Rick. Could you read it to me for me, please? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexually immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idol tree. So you don't have no covetousness at all about your neighbor's wife or anything? Well, would lust be covet? Pardon me? Lust. I guess would lust you're lusting after something you want something you could lust yeah that could be a a, a, a transition change but there again you're putting something before god that's the whole thing is the sound doctrine you're, you're, that's what we're finding out here first corinthians chapter 10 verses 5 to 14 nevertheless god was not pleased with most of them their bodies were scattered over the desert now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan, re pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. 
and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Amen. As we were told earlier about the Old Testament, again, look, we're not, we're not much different than our brothers and sisters uh, back in the nation of Israel. And they're, they're rebellious people because they keep on forgetting and uh, here Paul is reminding us that we have to be mindful and uh, not think that sometimes pride comes before the fall, Scripture says. Sometimes we think we're okay, we're above it all, and we're cruising along, and uh, we ended up getting sideswiped by the devil. We remember that sometimes we're tempted to, to jump off track. Uh, this immorality and or whatever it might be, uh, covetedness or whatever uh, that Paul is saying there and telling the Corinthians that you're, God's not going to give you no more what you can handle. And that's how important it is for us to be back with him, that, that relationship, the daily relationship and, and, and fellowship with, with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and the studying of the word and the sound doctrine so that whenever these issues come, we can stand up against them and also tell others to share it with others because our life, how do you do that? How do you not, you know, how did you change your life? How do you not do those things you used to do? Why does your, is your attitude changed? Well, because of the sound doctrine that you're going to, that you stand by through revelation through the word of God and by equipping of the Holy Spirit through your relationship with Jesus Christ. So we're, he's laying it out here with these different passages. Uh, last passage is 1 John. We back toward Revelation. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. <laughs> Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Pretty simple, huh? <laughs> yeah. Little children, that's us, right? Because Jesus talked about you. As you become, need to become as a child, of, a, a child, become as a child uh, to help us understand and, and get into the kingdom of God. That's humility and trust and faith in God. And uh, as we guard ourselves from a, from idols. So, as we look at all this, and we, you know, we look at the Old Testament and we see how messed up they were. And we can blame them for a lot, but we start looking in the mirror, we go, uh-oh, I can be just as messed up in some places in my life that, uh, you know, there's some idolatry, hopefully not, but there's areas in our lives that we want to take uh, away from God having control, uh, physical, material, sensual, however that is, uh, is there idolatry in our lives? Elijah, Elijah, you know, they sought to lead the people to put down idols and to live and come back and following the true living God. And that's what we're hoping here, not only at the church, but also through Bible study. And each one of us, hopefully that we try to do that to people around us. That our testimony leads us and others to do the same thing. And uh, all the more we need the help of the word and one another uh, and stand on the truth and not twist it to our own, uh, our own liking so that we can do something maybe that, well, does it really mean that? <laughs> Sometimes we have to look at that uh, and examine our lives and examine the word of God and uh, walk in the truth of it. So our challenge this week is to spend some time in prayer and see where we stand in following the Lord in our lives. 
and asking God to help us tear down any idols in our lives that come between us and him and us serving him and following him. Because that's what Elijah and Elijah did. They tried and we see how they continued on and, and got, they struggled and it wasn't easy for them, but they continued on and God took care of them and watched over them, even whenever they were having, they were struggling uh, in their faith because they didn't, you know, the people weren't responsive. So, That's where we're gonna go. That's where I'd like you to go this week. Spend some time with the Lord. And if you wanna look over some of the passages, read over some Elijah uh, and these passages that you have and just ask God to, is there idols in my life that's keeping me from being who you want me to be? And how can, I, how can you help me? Tear them down and put sound doctrine in its place. And if you're already there and you know it, help him to show you and equip you to help others see it and help them to understand sound doctrine, the importance of sound doctrine. Those that you know may be around you that they're not walking in sound doctrine, but they think they got it. He's like, no, that's, that's not what the God's word says. Not to get an argument, just a challenge of, is there idols that keep us away from God? Um, so... question go ahead um i i often think i mean i think people interpret the bible sometimes to suit themselves okay um uh, now how do we know what the correct interpretation is like i have a lot of books that help me understand what i'm reading in the bible but how do I know which one's right? <laughs> That's a good question. A lot of it has to do with the spirit. Prayer and coming together in the spirit and knowing discernment of it has to work all through scripture. You can't just pull one verse out and apply it. You need to apply. But scripture. don't people do that? Don't people they do, do that? But don't make it right. Right. I know it doesn't. So you have to take a verse and add it with the rest of scripture to see if it stands up with the rest of scripture. You interpret scripture with scripture. And some of these commentaries will help you do language in that, but you do have to be careful on uh, certain areas. But there again, the gospel, Christ being the central part, we know that there's gonna be a, a return of Christ we know that we are, have the Holy Spirit within us. We know that God calls us to serve him. He gives us gifts and to follow through and using them and reading the scriptures to apply to our lives that we become more like Jesus. How is that? We can get caught up in, in certain nuances in scripture that take us away from all that, but it all comes back to the basics growing and are we change as our lives changing and becoming more like jesus and these sound doctrines are very black and white now there's other areas that you're going to mix in with but there again uh you you be care you just have to be careful with what you are interpreting in the scriptures um but it can't get you away from Jesus and who he is, his deity and the, the Trinity and uh, those things cannot be wavered on. So it'd have to be instances, different things, yeah, looked at. But yeah, you have to be careful because some people take one scripture out and say, okay, this is what that means. Like, well, okay, that scripture needs to add with other scripture to see is that truly the context and understanding of that word. Man, it gets quiet sometimes out there. <laughs> yeah. 
It's because your brains are working. I hope the gears are turning. I can hear mine rattling. <laughs> That's right. We can't see the another. out there, so we can't see if the smoke's coming out of your ears or not. <laughs> no, it's coming out of my nostrils. Oh, uh oh. Mm -hmm. I to make you mad. No, I, another kidding. thing, I, I have a question. Okay. When, so you profess to be a Christian, but I don't know how to phrase this exactly. But I still think you need to, like, I'm not going to lay down and let people walk all over me just because I'm a Christian. Okay. I'm going to fight back, and I do. Well, fighting back, again, Jesus didn't fight back, or sometimes Jesus No, didn't. I know he didn't. But, he did flip the tables, though. But yeah, see, that's what I mean. There's a, there's a time, and, and you're fighting, your style of fighting is, is hopefully going to be a little different. Because we're going to fight with truth, and we're going to fight with with standing on truth and what is right. And hopefully we can have a, a, a character of, of love. Now I'm saying this because it's not always, it's not easy. It's not easy, but, but are we, when we're standing our ground on truth, are we standing our ground in love in, in a Christ-like attitude where we standing because, you know, again, flesh rears up and I'm standing my ground and I'm coming at you and I'm going to get right on your level or there again, it's a spirit thing. And yeah, it doesn't say that we're supposed to let everybody take advantage of us. That's not the idea. We're to stand up for the truth. As we stand up for the truth in a godly manner, people see something different. That's all that I hope we can do. That basically, here's just a, a rough one, I know. But if someone's coming at you and they're cussing and fussing and carrying on, you don't cuss and fuss back. No, I don't cuss, but I might go. fuss. But you can fuss, but how you fuss in a way that is, okay, I'm trying to get a, a truth across and not, you know what I mean? It's, it's a... Sometimes, no matter how much you try to use control or, or try to make the person see that they're wrong, oh, I, I had a confirmation. I it's, it's, sometimes they get a little bit loud. Well, sometimes you get loud, don't make it any better because they still hear you and they're still not going to change. I know they do. It's a God thing. It's a God thing. And so, so how do you how do you you have to ask God I mean, I've tried to control you see this coming and you're gonna rouse up and you're gonna holler at them and you're gonna see them shut down, then it's time like, well, wait a minute. Okay, you don't get it. I'm not gonna force myself. It's just gotta stop. We'll come back and let's talk about this some other time. There's a time when, because if you're flaring up and then, because you're getting angry because they don't get it and you get it and you think they should get it. So it's like, okay, we're not getting anywhere. So we just need to like, okay, it's time to stop. Let's talk some other time because all we're doing is aggravating and then the devil gets in there and aggravation starts happening and we get farther away than closer together sometimes. But I know there's sometimes we don't, I don't understand why they don't get it. Well, especially if it's spiritual. Well, it, it, it's like, you know, you get, you're trying to get through to a company. And all you get are recordings. And no matter what you do, they will not put you through to a representative or an associate. Or, representative. Yeah. yeah. So that really irritates me. Okay. Okay. That is irritating. That is irritating. But some of it's out, it's out of your control. This but if, frustrates if, me too that you used to be able to operate or bang and you'd be able to talk to somebody and get 
your issues out. And now it's push three, push two, get here, get there. And they do that just to throw you off their target. And if you can just stay online, I guess, or I don't know what to do, pray about it and ask God, like, get me through. Uh, I don't know, or go higher up. But yeah, it is frustrating. It is frustrating. Yeah. It frustrates us all. By the time you do get to a person, you're so worked up, you want to choke them. Yeah, and that poor person, <laughs> and that poor person, yeah, and that poor person is probably in the office somewhere, overseas somewhere, and is like, "Hello," you know, and and you can't, and the, the connection is, isn't always good, and then it's just frustrating more. And that poor person is just like, "Hey, I just work here," um, but uh, yeah, I try not to take it out on the lowly people. Right, but that's why I always ask for a, a manager or a supervisor. Right. Yeah, I want to talk to somebody else. And by that time, you're getting disconnected. <laughs> you're right. You're right. And that and makes, that makes you more furious. 